Through every battle Through every heartbreak Through every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress You are my portion You are my hiding place I believe that you are the way The truth From Stucco, we are here at Silver Birch Ranch and have just finished an amazing week of high school camp and are currently in the middle of our middle school camp as well. We've done things like zip lining, tubing, a giant slip and slide with lots and lots of kids running all around. It's been so much 
fun. And students have also had the opportunity to grow in their faith through encounter sessions at the beach and worship and teaching at the chapel in the evenings. It's been fantastic having them have small group connections and continuing to learn more about the U plus life. They've been able to have real connections with each other and conversations about how to take tangible next steps in their relationship with Jesus. We've also had more than 40 students get baptized and 15 students and leaders recommit their lives to following Jesus. It's been truly fantastic and it's all because of your generosity. Because of the scholarships and the regular giving that you've been able to do, it's allowed over 500 students and leaders to come to camp once again to experience this beautiful creation and to connect more with Jesus. So thank you for being the church. It was amazing to see God at work in the hearts and minds of our students at camp. Thank you to all the leaders, parents, and to all of you who gave back to God here at Community for making summer camp possible. I can't wait to see what God does through this next generation. Hello and welcome to Community Online. If you are new here, a special welcome to you. By joining us today, you've already taken your first step and we'd love to help you take your next steps. Just create your account at communityonline.tv so we can learn your name and reach out to you this week. If you've already created your account, go ahead and log in so we know who's celebrating with us today. And feel free to say hello in the chat or request prayer. We'd love to connect with you. Here at Community, we are committed to helping people find their way back to God. We believe that the life that you are longing for can be found in a growing connection with God, the church, and the world God's given us to love and serve. It's what we've been calling the U Plus life, and we want to help one another experience it. A great way to get started in this U Plus life is to have a U Plus conversation. This is a conversation you could have with someone else in the church to help you discern how God is at work in your life and the unique next steps you're being led to take. To find out more and get started with the U Plus conversation, scan the QR code or visit uplus.info. In a few moments, our lead pastor, Dave Ferguson, is going to bring us the last message in our IM series. But first, let's take time to give back to God. We've been looking at what scripture teaches us about finances and managing money. In the book of Proverbs, we read, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. This passage is rather harsh and eye-opening at the same time. It is warning us of the dangers of overextending ourselves financially. God calls us to be wise with our finances and to not let ourselves be enslaved by unnecessary debt. Jesus came to offer us a different type of life, a life to the full, a life that is lived in the freedom that Jesus came to offer, including financial freedom. Giving back to God is one of the ways we can express that freedom. So I encourage you to join me right now in giving your tithe and offering. You can give and set up a recurring gift by going to givenow.cc, downloading the app or using the QR code on screen or simply text GIVE to 331-226-1686. And now here's Dave with today's message. Movies are back in 2023, and movies are back in a big way. Uh, the Barbie movie, it's already made more than a billion dollars. And Oppenheimer, only a mere $300 million. And of course, together they make the Barbenheimer. How, how many of you did the Barbenheimer? Yeah? Now, if the year was 1927 instead of 2023, rather than talking about Greta Gerwig and the Barbie movie, we'd be talking about Cecil B. DeMille and the movie King of Kings, where DeMille, as the director, took on the monumental task of bringing the life of Jesus to the big screen. And DeMille wanted the just right actor for the role of Jesus. So he chose a guy, a British actor, by the name of H.B. Warner. But DeMille kept Warner on a very short leash while filming King of Kings, because DeMille was sure that any behavior by a starring actor deemed inconsistent with the character of Christ 
would result in negative publicity for the film. In fact, DeMille was so concerned that he had Warner sign an agreement that barred him for five years from appearing in any film roles that might compromise his holy image. And on top of that, during the film, Warner was driven to the set in a car with blinds drawn. He was made to wear a black veil as he was delivered to the set so as not to see anything that was evil or unholy. DeMille also separated Warner from other cast members, forcing him to eat alone every day so as not to get exposed to anything or anyone who might tempt him. And if all that wasn't enough, Warner was not allowed to play cards. He couldn't go to baseball games. He was not allowed to to, to ride in a convertible, and he couldn't go swimming. The result? All the rules and regulations did not make Warner more holy. Instead, all the pressure to be perfect turned out to be too much. It was during the production of King of Kings, rather than becoming more like Jesus, the actor Warner, he relapsed into his alcohol addiction and his life spiraled out of control. Director Cecil B. DeMille, he could not force change. H.B. Warner, the actor, he couldn't manufacture change. And this leads me to a profoundly important question. I want us to really wrestle with this question today. How does change happen? How does change happen? Think about that. How does change actually happen? How do we become the people we want to become and avoid becoming people we don't want to become? And, and more specifically, for those of us who claim to be Christ followers, like me, how do we become more like Jesus? Because it appears that being driven around blindfolded and not playing cards and not going swimming, <laughs> that's not going to get it done. So how does change happen? And, and I think this is a particularly important question for today and a very significant question for 2023. Let me give you a couple reasons why. Uh, the Wall Street Journal printed an article just in April titled The Surprising Surge of Faith Among Young People. And it said this, it said the percentage of young people, 18 to 25, who believe in God has jumped by 30% since COVID. 30% more, 18 to 25 year olds say they now believe in God. I mean, that, that is a huge increase in faith in a very short period of time. Why? And the Barna Research Group followed it up and is now calling Gen Z, that same demographic, they're calling them the open generation because they're more open to Jesus than any other age group today. They're more open to Jesus than millennials, more open than busters, and more open than boomers. And as I kind of step back, I believe this is the first generation in U.S. history that's grown up in a truly post-Christian culture. They didn't grow up with faith or necessarily going to church. And now they're coming out of COVID and dealing with stuff like mental health struggles, polarizing political ideologies, issues around social justice. And, and they are asking for the answers to the big questions of life. Like, how do we change the world? Or, or even closer, how do we change our community? Or more specifically, how do I change? And here's the thing, change is difficult. Um, do this with me. Go ahead and just, wherever you are, you're joining me right now, just cross your arms. Just cross your arms. Go ahead, do it. All right, you've done this dozens of times, hundreds, thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And you've always done it exactly the same way. I want you to do something. Now, do it the other way. <laughs> it, it, just, it just feels weird, doesn't it? To change. It feels awkward. Just that little change, right? Ugh. This is much better. Or I'll do this. Clasp your hands. Go ahead and clasp your hands. Wherever you are, just clasp your hands. All right? You've done this motion thousands, tens of thousands of times. And you've always done it the exact same way. Now I want to ask you to change. Go ahead and put the other finger on top. <laughs> it just feels weird to change, doesn't it? I don't even know if I could pray like this. I don't even know if God would hear me. I, I got to do it this way. Here, here's the point I'm making. Change is hard. Change is awkward. So back to our question. How do we change? 
Jesus answers that question with some counterintuitive teaching on how change actually happens in John chapter 15. He uses an agricultural metaphor to explain about how change can happen. And in this teaching, before I get to the, the text, I'm going to explain. God is the gardener, okay? And remember, the gardener owns the garden. The gardener controls the garden. God's the gardener. Jesus is the vine. And the vine is the thing that brings sustenance and life to the branches. And then we are the branches. And as branches, we're totally dependent on the vine. And the vine is totally dependent on the gardener. And so Jesus explains this in John chapter 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. Ask, it'll be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. All right, this whole image is really about productivity, growth, and bringing about change. And there are two, I mean, just powerful truths that jump out of what we just heard. That we, and I just, we just can't miss this. Here's the first truth we just heard. You cannot change by yourself. You cannot change by yourself. Jesus says no branch can bear fruit by itself. And in case we miss it, Jesus repeats himself and comes back and says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing apart from me. No thing. Second truth. Change happens when you remain. Did you catch that? Eight times, okay? Eight times, Jesus says the word remain. Remain, 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 remain. If you want to see long-lasting change happen in your life, and if you want to see sustainable change happen in the world, it's going to happen as you and I, as we remain in Christ. Okay, that's a key word. I want you to get this word. The word is remain. And here's the thing about remaining, okay? It's both easy and hard. Let me, let me explain. You, you, you got a toddler in your life? Because if you do, if, if you've ever told a toddler, hey, just stay put, or just remain right there. You know that's both easy and hard. <laughs> it's easy to explain, but it's hard for them to stay put. It's hard for them to remain. But learning to remain, as you're going to learn from Jesus, it is crucial and essential to change. And the hardest time to remain is when the gardener, going back to the metaphor, is pruning. Now, I'm not a gardener. No, I can't grow anything. So for all of you non-gardener types, pruning is when you trim back plants. And in our lives, if we want to see change, we need to remain through God's pruning. Now, Jesus refers to two different types of pruning in John 15, particularly right there in verse 2. He says this, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So the first type of pruning is really more negative. The branch is dry, it's bearing no fruit, and so the gardener cuts it off, throws it away. Because if you don't do this kind of pruning, the dead parts can kill the whole vine. Now the second type of pruning is more positive. The branch is living, it's healthy, and so the gardener prunes to produce even more fruit. But in both cases, pruning requires that the branch to do what? What does the branch have to do? Okay, it has to, here's the, it's our word, remain. I want you to get, remain, it has to remain. And my hunch is even right now, there are areas of your life, and I know there are areas in my life where God's pruning, pruning you and pruning me, right? And it's to bring about 
the change that he wants to see in us. And it might be in a relationship. You're at a place where you're, I mean, you're, you want to give up. And God's saying, no, remain. Or you're not wanting to forgive. But as you remain in him, he's saying, no, forgive others just as I've forgiven you. Or it might be in your work life. You see other people cutting corners, getting ahead, and it feels like, man, I'm just falling further and further behind. But Jesus is saying, no, do it my way and remain. Or it might be something regarding your finances. Things are tight. And the obvious item is, I mean, you know, just cut some of that charitable giving. But God has called you to be generous, and he's saying, no, remain. Or it might be something that is entirely unique to you. And it hurts. It hurts to go through that pruning process. It's, it's painful to be pruned. But God is either getting rid of something that's dying or he's working to make something more fruitful. And it's to bring about the change that he wants to see in you and I. Bible teacher Beth Moore, she explains it this way. She says, God could just perfect us the moment we decide to follow Jesus. But God seems to like to grow things. God is like a gardener. And he'll prune what needs to be pruned to make us more fruitful. The goal of pruning is growth and change. But for you to change, you must do what? Come on, help me out. Remain. You gotta remain during the pruning. And I know it's hard. I know it's painful. But I promise you, I promise you, it will be worth it. It'll bring about the change that you wanna see and that God wants to see in us. Now, now here's the second secret behind pruning. The reason pruning works is that it's part of a longer term process. So if you wanna see change happen, not only do you have to remain through the pruning, but you also have to remain through the process. Arthur Margaret Feinberg, and I, I got to know Margaret, she wrote this book about John 15, this passage we're talking about, and the whole pruning process. And it's really cool, because in order to understand Jesus' metaphor about vine and branches, she went out and visited two different California vineyards so she could really learn about it. And a vintner, okay, you've never heard that term vintner? A vintner is someone who grows grapes to make wine. A vintner will prune branches the first year, the second year, and the third year without ever producing a crop. In fact, it's not until the third year that they even see the first kind of viable cluster of grapes. And a serious vintner will actually leave that cluster of grapes on the vine. And it's not until the fourth year that they'll actually see a harvest. And what is the job of the branches? You know, for four years, they must simply remain. They are to remain in the vine and trust the gardener. And for those growing grapes for winemaking, they'll bottle their harvest, but they won't taste the fruit of their labors for seven or eight years. And I am told that most vineyards like in Napa Valley won't reach a break-even point for their investment financially until 15 years or more. So learning all that, Feinberg, our, that author, she elaborates. She says, sometimes I look at my own life and wonder, why am I not more fruitful? And why does pruning have to hurt so much? Why does cultivating a healthy crop take so long? Yet those questions circle around the here and now. God's perspective is much different. Like a good vineyard owner, he knows how to bring about fruitfulness better than I ever will. And he is patient with me more patient than I am with myself. Also, as we fulfill our callings, we must recognize that like the vintners, our fruitfulness will not come overnight. The first harvest of our labors may not come for three or five years. Understand, if we're gonna change and transform into what God wants us to be, we need to do what? Here's our word again, remain. Remain through the process. We have to remain through the process. And here's a hard truth. It's probably gonna take longer to get good fruit than we think. All right, what's this like in our own lives? Well, for some of us, um, it might be in your marriage right now. Things have been hard for a while. There's conflict, there's problems. There's lots of selfishness you'd rather not see in yourself or your spouse. And it's getting really difficult for you to stay in it. And you're thinking about bailing. And I'm telling you, unless there's abuse, I, I think Jesus is saying, no, remain in the process. 
For some of us, it might be an addiction. And I mean, you are trying to face it. And the progress is feeling slow. And the setbacks, they keep happening. But Jesus says, no, remain. Remain in that process. One day at a time. Remain. And for some of us, whatever the change you want, you, you, you want to see it happen in 2023, right? I get it. Well, here's the bad news. You may not see it in 2023. You may not even see it in 2024. But I also have good news for you. If you remain in the process, you will bear good fruit. You will see change. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I don't want to remain in the process. I want change to happen like today or tomorrow or next week, right? Yeah, me too. But that's not how change works. Jesus says, no, you remain in the process. But I've also got some more good news for you. When Jesus invites us to remain, he doesn't leave us alone. Instead, he invites us to remain actually in his presence. Do you remember what Jesus said back to our verse? He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So this remaining, now we're kind of moving out of this agriculture metaphor. He says, remain in me. This is the good news. You don't have to do this on your own. And I think many of us fear that the Christian life is kind of like wandering in the middle of a field all by yourself and we're sticking a branch into the ground and then hoping, okay, that one little branch all by itself is going to grow and flourish and bear lots of fruit. That's not at all what Jesus says the Christian life is about. No, he says, and he invites us, he says, remain in me. Jesus says, I'll actually be with you the whole time because he is the vine that we remain in. He's the hope. He's the one who gives you the energy. He's the one that gives you the sustenance. He gives you the life, the perseverance to keep going through what you're going through so we can eventually experience the change. And see, some of us right now, we're in the midst of pruning right now. And it's been hard. It's been a hard season. I mean, some of you are worn out. You've been in the process for a long time. It feels like the process of growth, the process of patience, and even just the process of suffering. Man, is it ever going to end? You've begun realizing. Also, though, there's some blind spots. You've experienced some significant strain in key relationships. Maybe you've been struggling with your faith. And what Jesus says, he says, remain in me and my presence will remain in you. All right, so how do we, how? How do we remain in his presence if that's so important? What, what does this practically look like? Well, here at Community, we like to talk about three connections, three connections that come together in, in a you plus life. And if you think about it, these are three very practical ways that we're invited to remain in Jesus' presence. So what are they? Well, here they are. There's your connection to God. This connection to God, it can look like worshiping together on Sunday. It can look like prayer. It can be reading your Bible. It can be reading your Bible along with using the community daily that we send to you in an email every day, your connection with God. There's also your connection with the church, God's people. I mean, through those friendships and accountability in small groups, through serving teams, that's how you remain. And then finally, there's the connection to the whole world. These are intentional ways that you offer your time and your money and your abilities to bless the world around you. And it can quite literally look like the blessed practices, those simple steps of praying and, and listening and eating and, and serving and storytelling with our neighbors. It can also look like community cares and all the other ways our church is involved both locally and globally in blessing the world. I believe, our church believes, that these three connections are how you, here's our word again, remain in Christ. At the start of our time together, I mentioned this burning question that Gen Z and our culture, maybe even you, I know I am, are asking this morning, how does change happen? How does it happen? And too often we try to force change, much like Cecil B. DeMille did with H.B. Warner, trying to kind of white knuckle it ourselves or trying to force our expectations on the people in the world around us. But what if change is actually easier and harder than we think? It's simply to remain. See, Jesus promises if you remain in him, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to see fruit growing in your relationship with God. You're going to see fruit growing in your relationships 
with people around you. You're going to see fruit growing in the ways that you're blessing the world. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he just lays it out there and he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, when you remain, here's what you're going to see. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Come on, don't you want that kind of fruit? Don't you want that kind of change? And, and not only to take place in your own life, but also take place in the world. If that kind of fruit's going to grow, we need to remain in the pruning. We need to remain in the process. But always, 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 we are reminded that Jesus' presence is going to remain with us. And if we remain, I'm telling you, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are going to overflow from our lives. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Are you remaining in Jesus? Every week when we receive communion together, it is an opportunity to bring our thoughts, our affections, and our allegiance back from wherever we may have wandered to center ourselves once again on Jesus. He is present with us. He is our source of life. He is the one we need. He is the vine and we are the branches. So I invite you to take these next few moments to center your mind and heart on Him as we prepare to receive communion together. The 
God who cares, the God who stays the same, the God who loves or how he loves, the God who knows my name. Let's remember Jesus, the vine, the source of life, as we receive the bread, his body broken for us. And his blood shed for us. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for that reminder to remain in you that you call us to do that, Lord, and that you give us opportunities like this to be able to plug back in and be reconnected to you. Thank you for the life that you offer us today. And Lord, help us to see that life to the full. We thank you, Lord, it's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found our time together meaningful and inspiring. As always, you can find information about everything happening here at Community at communitychristian.info including messages you may have missed that you could watch on demand. And speaking of messages that you may have missed, all the Bible scholars in the house may be aware that in the book of John, there was one more I am statement that Jesus made. He said, I am the light of the world. And since next week, we conclude our Kingdom Perspective series, we produced a bonus message for the I am series tomorrow on our YouTube channel. Join community pastor John Prine as he breaks down that powerful I am statement that Jesus made. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you right back here next week at Community Online.